When the Civil War began, nobody expected the long-lasting conflict. Both armies paroled prisoners, so the captured troops were released on the condition that they won't fight again. Surely soldiers were spotted on battlefields again shortly after. An exchange system established in 1862 lasted less than a year. Both the North and the South had thousands of prisoners of war. Long before the terrible concentration camps of the First and Second World Wars, America had its own Dachau and Buchenwald. The confined soldiers suffered greatly. During the Civil War, about 150 camps were built, housing around 400,000 inmates. More than 50,000 people were not lucky enough to get out of these camps alive. In the South, captured Union soldiers were initially locked in abandoned warehouses and barns. Six abandoned tobacco factories in Danville, Virginia, were used as a Confederate prison camp. The facility housed nearly 7,000 captured Union soldiers and served as both a permanent prison and a transportation terminal. The brick and wooden structures were empty of all furniture, including chairs and lights. Diseases like smallpox and dysentery spread quickly because of the overcrowded and dirty environment, killing approximately 1,400 captives. As the number of court soldiers grew, Following the end of regular exchanges in 1863, camps were constructed specially as prisons. The first South Camp, Salisbury Prison, was located in North Carolina. In 1861, it had been converted from a firmly constructed cotton mill. In the early months of the camp's activity, the conditions inside Salisbury were rather good. The 120 or so Union soldiers held there were fed small but enough rations the cleanliness was adequate, shelter from the weather was provided, and the captives were even allowed to play recreational games such as baseball. However, as the war went on, the situation at Salisbury worsened. By October 1864, there were more than 5,000 Union prisoners inside Salisbury, and within a few months, that number had risen to more than 10,000. With an increase in men came overcrowding poor sanitation, food shortages, and therefore the spread of disease, filth, starvation, and death. This was a common thread among camps during the Civil War. Salisbury is a classic illustration of the effects of overcrowding on prison populations. As the population was low in 1861, the death rate was roughly 2%. The death rate exceeded 28% in 1865, when the jail population peaked. Union's first camp wasn't any better. Camp Chase, located on farmland outside of Columbus, Ohio, originated as a training facility for Ohio volunteers preparing to fight on Civil War battlefields. As Union victories resulted in an increase in Confederate prisoners, Camp Chase expanded its activities to involve the imprisonment of thousands of Confederate enlisted men. Shortly after its opening, the camp housed almost 300 inmates. The majority of them were civilian political prisoners from Kentucky and Virginia. The prisoners were never purposely starved, but because the Union Army prioritized feeding its own soldiers, they frequently went hungry. As the prison population grew, living conditions deteriorated dramatically. Diseases like smallpox, typhoid and pneumonia ravaged Camp Chase, killing hundreds. During the winter of 1862, a single smallpox outbreak killed almost 300 men. Prisoners suffered from starvation and exposure during the freezing winters. More than 2,000 Confederate soldiers died at the camp. In addition to the many rows of high white marble headstones, two memorials honor the men who died in the camp. We will now dive much deeper into the abyss of suffering of Civil War prisoners. Camp Sumter, better known as Andersonville Prison, was the deadliest landscape of the Civil War. Just imagine those numbers. Of the 45,000 Union soldiers imprisoned here, nearly 13,000 died. Almost 30% of all people could not withstand such torture. The first soldiers came to Camp Sumter in late February 1864. Over the next few months, around 400 inmates arrived every day. Andersonville was more than eight times overloaded at its peak. The stockade was built in the shape of a rectangle 
that measured 1,620 feet long and 779 feet wide. The deadline, located around 19 feet inside the stockade wall, was not to be crossed by the captives. If a prisoner crossed the deadline, guards at the pigeon roosts, which were around 30 yards apart, had the right to shoot them. Sergeant Major Robert Kellogg of the 16th Regiment of Connecticut Volunteers described his arrival at the prison camp as a prisoner. As we entered the area, we were struck with a sight that nearly froze our blood and caused our hearts to break. Before us stood folks who had once been active and lively, stalwart men who were now nothing more than walking skeletons covered in dirt and vermin. In the heat of their emotions, many of our soldiers shouted earnestly, Can this be hell? God protect us! In the center of the hole was a swamp, covering about three or four acres of the limited borders, and a part of this marshy spot had been used as a sink by the convicts, and feces coated the ground, the smell of which was suffocating. The little creek that served as the camp's primarily water supply for drinking and bathing became polluted as a result of inmates relieving themselves there, as well as sewage and other waste poured into the swampy area feeding the stream. Wells were covered over and kept inaccessible after prisoners exploited them to hide escape tunnels. Limited meals of cornmeal, meat or bacon resulted in severe vitamin C deficiencies, which frequently led to lethal cases of scurvy. By the end of March 1865, there was nothing but cornmeal and a little salt. Despite the fact that the prison was surrounded by woods, the prisoners were only allowed a little amount of wood for warmth and cooking. This, combined with a lack of tools, made it extremely difficult for the inmates to prepare the little food rations they were given. During the summer of 1864, Union prisoners suffered heavily due to hunger, exposure, and sickness. Within seven months, almost a third had died of dysentery and scurvy, and they were buried in mass graves. In addition to the high rate of scurvy, Many inmates suffered from severe diarrhea, which weakened their already fragile bodies. Sergeant Samuel Cawthill, Company C, 4th Massachusetts Cavalry, remembered. You could go and pick all the lice off of yourself, sit down for a half a moment, and then stand up, and you'd be covered with them. Between these two hills was swampy, all black mud, and where the filth was dumped, it was all alive. There was a constant buzz, and it was covered in enormous white maggots. Prisoners were not given new clothes, and their existing clothing was frequently torn. In some cases, clothing was taken from the corpse. According to John McElroy, an Andersonville prisoner, before one was fairly cold, his clothes would be stolen and divided, and I have seen many sharp fights between contesting claimants. Captain Richard Winder, the Confederate quartermaster officer assigned to Andersonville, was ultimately responsible for providing shelter for the captives. Winder was unable to complete the mission due to the location of sawmills, the need to supply lumber to railroads, bureaucratic red tape, inflation, and general incompetence. Left to care for themselves, the prisoners did their best to create their own shelters known as shebangs, with the few resources they had. Escape was a common topic of discussion among the prisoners, and numerous attempts were made. Some convicts attempted to tunnel out, while others fled outside the stockade when on duty. One smart prisoner pretended to be dead, had two friends transport him to the dead house, and then got up and fled after dark. Shortly after, guards detected the scheme and had the bodies examined by a surgeon before allowing them to be buried. A group of inmates known as the Andersonville Raiders attacked other prisoners in an attempt to steal food, jewelry, money, and clothing. They were equipped primarily with clubs and killed to get anything they wanted. Peter Big Pete Aubrey created another gang called Regulators to combat crime. They captured almost all of the raiders and hanged them later. Captain Henry Wurz, the commandant of Andersonville, was executed as a war criminal for failing to provide enough supplies and shelter to the prisoners. Wirt's last words were that he was being hanged for following orders as a soldier. He must be happy that his prisoners never got a chance to take their revenge. However, a recent studying of the evidence suggests that they did face actual food shortages. There were just too many captives and not enough food, 
clothing, medicine, or tents for everyone. The torches ended when the Union Army liberated Andersonville Prison in May 1865. The inmates inside were found and described as human skeletons amid hellish scenes of desolation. Camp Douglas was often called the Andersonville of the North. Camp Douglas began as a training station for Illinois divisions, but later transformed into a jail camp. By the end of the war, there were 18,000 Confederates incarcerated. After investigating the camp, the United States Sanitary Commission reported that the amount of standing water, of unpoliced grounds, of foul sinks, of general disorder, of soil reeking with miasmic accretions, of rotten bones, and emptying of camp kettles, was enough to drive a sanitarian mad. The barracks were so filthy and contaminated that the committee declared, nothing but fire can cleanse them. Commandants intentionally reduced ration sizes and quality for their own benefit, resulting in disease, scurvy, and hunger. By 1865, one out of every seven prisoners died, bringing the total to 4,200. Thanks for watching, subscribe, and press likes.